Welcome everyone to the fourth chapter of the webinar series of the International Network of Science, Religion and Health. I am Rafael Casarin, social scientist based at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. I'm the coordinator of the network and together with Marti Vieira, network director, we organize the seminar series. This network is funded by the International Network for the Study of Science and Belief in Society. Our aim is to connect academics and practitioners promote knowledge exchange, and provide training for researchers working on social and cultural narratives on science, religion, and health. Today, we are very excited to have two members of the network. We have here Dr. Gerosine Mossier, Associate Professor at the Institute of Religious Studies of the University of Montreal. Her more than 50 professional publications address contemporary religiosities, including religious diversity in secular societies. We also have Dr. Paul Premedet. Premedet sorry, um, Paul is a professor and director at the Center of the Study for the Studies in Religion and Society at the University of Victoria. Much of his research is interdisciplinary and policy-oriented on emerging understandings of religious, political, and ethnic identities in liberal democratic societies. I just would like to give you a friendly reminder, reminder uh, to please keep your microphones muted during our speaker's presentation. And following the presentations, we will spare some time for questions and discussions. So if you prefer, feel also free to post them, uh, your questions in the chat. I will leave now the screen uh, to our presenters and yeah, thank you. Thanks, Raphael. Um, so as Raphael mentioned, I'm Paul, and I'm really happy to see some uh, very old friends and some, uh, I hope, new friends. Uh, so I'm going to give a slightly more elaborate introduction to Geraldine, just so you have a sense of how fortunate we all are to be in her presence today. Uh, and then she's going to give her, her talk, and then uh, Raphael and I will lightly collaborate on co-hosting a broader discussion on the kind of really, I think, quite rich set of themes Geraldine is going to introduce. So Geraldine Massier is an anthropologist and associate professor. She's jointly affiliated with the U of M's Religious Studies Institute and the Department of Anthropology. She has explored new forms of religiosity in their various dimensions with the support of several grants. She's basically won uh, grants from the two major agencies in, in Canada, as well as the ones in Quebec. And she's also held a research chair in trans-regional studies in France in 2019. She's produced over 20 articles or chapters on migrant churches, on monograph and about 20 articles on conversion to Islam, and also many publications on religious trajectories and life paths. Really, if you know anything about religious studies in Canada, you'll know that she's really considered part of the central reading for um, religious regimes in Quebec, which as many of you will know, has a quite distinctive historical and religious history compared with the rest of uh, Canada. And really, one of the things I really appreciate about, about her work is that she's shown that the theme of healing cuts across the diverse field site, sites that she's been looking at over, over the years. She's the founder of an interdisciplinary international study group on healing hosted by the CIRRES, in which she collaborates with spiritual care practitioners and contributes to international scientific networks on health and spirituality. She integrates issues of accompaniment and care into a global perspective that considers wellness culture and neoliberal logics. And as a result, her research is really at the cutting edge of knowledge on the intersection between health and spirituality. And so as you can tell, she's really kind of the perfect person to take all of us into what I think is going to be a quite rich conversation about spiritual coaching, not just in Canada, but I think really in many Western liberal uh, democracies where we are, are dealing with very similar dynamics between church and state, but also state and religious communities and content conventional religious communities and unconventional or emerging spiritual formations and also formations of uh, alternative or adjacent healing um, regimes. So I'll now turn the microphone over to Geraldine and look forward to her insights as I, as I always do. So thank you, Rafael and Paul, for this uh, introduction. I didn't expect to have two introductions <laughs> for me. This is, I feel like, a big achievement in my career. <laughs> so thanks a lot uh, for inviting me uh, to present this research that Paul and I have designed. And in this brief talk, uh, I will 
give some insight uh, on this research in order maybe to open some avenues of research for the broader uh, field of religious uh, studies. So our research was designed uh, to focus on spiritual coaching and holistic practices, and more specifically on the legal, social, and epistemological considerations that we would like to raise today. And this, this research, oh, maybe I can do full screen, right? Is it better if I put full screen? No, actually I won't because otherwise I wouldn't see my, my notes. Um, oh my God. Um, <laughs> try full screen. Yeah, I, I think I'm gonna stop the share screen and I'm gonna start again. Oh my God. I don't see my notes. Hmm. <laughs> when I cut that. Uh, <laughs> for the record. Oh, I'm sorry. I have to close my PowerPoint because otherwise I don't see my notes any longer. I'm sorry. No problem. Um, no, oh. problem. no problem. <laughs> A little bit of stress. It's going to be okay. So um, the research stems from um, an obser empirical observation we had. Okay, sorry, the PowerPoint is a bit long to open. So we had a, an empirical observation regarding the rise of a very interesting phenomenon that is called a spiritual coaching. So I'm gonna share my screen again, and I promise I won't do full screen again. So, so this uh, observation um, has been, um, conveyed by different media. Uh, for example, here, the New York Times in 2022 uh, stated uh, about this, uh, this coach that uh, 40, 400 years ago would be called witches. But today, we call them coach. Um, and especially, uh, Paul and I have decided to focus, of course, on spiritual coaching and uh, as new actors of spiritualities that are much more, much more, much more roaming uh, on many media networks, like, for example, here on Facebook in Quebec, uh, this woman uh, uh, who basically reports that uh, she has just had her first appointment with a client she's going to follow for three months, and she will, and she says she will use her gifts of mediumnity as a channel to accompany her client in awakening, choosing herself as a guide, bringing to light what is at the heart of her daily life to raise her frequency. So here you see the semantics of spirituality and at the same time this idea of coaching and following someone on a, a, a quite long term three months. Um, other, other persons on media, here we have uh, another woman who has a more structured website where she offers her services online for counseling and work on inner wisdom and wellness. And she says, as we are all spiritual beings having a human experience. So there are very uh, there is this phenomenon that is widespread on media uh, platforms, Instagram, Facebook, website uh, of of course with very different levels of sophistication. Some are, some of them are just starting and say, and reporting their own uh, experience and saying they want to help people and accompany them, like the first women I showed. But then we have other persons who have more uh, more structured website and services and who actually make a life with these uh, services. So, um, of course, um, there is uh, the archetype uh, of uh, of spiritual coaching that can be uh, th that is Chopra, uh, who reaches a worldwide audience as much to train what he calls well-being coach. So here is not spiritual coach, but well-being coach, as well as to coach person to and I quote empower them to be experts in their own life and master their mind, body, and spirit connection. Um, and this is something that uh, summarizes very well, very well this whole idea of spiritual coaching, that is to transmit techniques and tools to master the mind, body, and spirit connection. So uh, it is a spiritual milieu, but it is also in many ways an industry that is very dynamic and that is quite quickly uh, changing. It is uh, based on the appropriation uh, 
uh, of spirit track practices, of Asian roots, but also of indig indigenous uh, root. And it likes to be uh, legitimized by um, uh, borrowing a scientific framework to, to, um, to present their uh, activities. What is really, of course, uh, very important is that they focus on healing concerns. And uh, they have their own definitions of health of healing, of care, of what is a body, what is an individual, and what is well-being, uh, with, with well-being not only being the physical well-being, but also the emotional, the social, and even on the broader scale, the well-being of the whole planet, and including the Earth. Uh, so healing is, is very important in this regard. So, um, some of the issues that are related to the rise of spiritual coaches, uh, it's of course that these coaches are seen as figures of authority and common imagination usually construct these figures of authority around the guru archetype who is Osho, uh, as you know. And um, those, those spiritual coaches are usually considered through uh, the spread of possible spiritual abuse they may uh, have and do uh, over vulnerable clients that would be subjugated by their charisma and using brainwashing techniques. So this, of course, uh, overlooks the fact that this idea of spiritual coaching is really present uh, in many religious tradition uh, with the figure of the guide that is present in, for example, in Christianity with this idea of spiritual direction that has been very uh, important in Christianity and in many religious tradition. So, um, so the, 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 the issue, um, so it's also a, a, a business industry uh, there, there's a financial issue by our own account. Uh, the price of sessions with coaches varies between 80 uh, US dollars and 30, uh, sorry, 300 US dollars, while home coaching programs can cost between $500 uh, and $10,000. Uh, so it's really high, and this limits the scope of the topic to the upper middle class of clients. So it's, it's, it's like a, a white upper middle class. Um, uh, topic and issue. Uh, and I would say that this industry is, of course, uh, governed by the market logic with its own, own logic of competition, which raises the issue of the commercialization of spirituality. And this has been documented in the literature like uh, this, the, well, you, you probably know the whole literature that sees how spirituality and spiritual techniques are, are used maybe to numb the individual. Uh, we, we have this French um, intellectual, um, I forget his name, uh, who says that actually these spiritualities that tend to um, give responsibility to the individual and uh, overlook the responsibility of the of the society. So there is this whole literature that see this commercialization of spirituality as a way to give too much responsibility on the individual and also to numb the individual and uh, overlook the neoliberal logics that structure the whole uh, the whole uh, topic. On the other hand, another literature see uh, those spiritual techniques and uh, spiritual coaching, which is part of the spiritual techniques, as uh, a potential uh, super subversive discourse that can actually balance and offset the, um, uh, the, 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 the neoliberal uh, dynamics and, and the authority and power of these dynamics on the, the individual. So, so there is these two uh, li literature that uh, tend to govern this um, the, the 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 way uh, studies uh, embrace the, the the topic. So it is uh, interestingly, uh, I think the healing focus has to be has to be dig uh, digged much more. Um, and uh, this healing focus uh, shows that uh, when you dig this, this focus, that it's a thriving, dynamic, and innovative alternative health industry that, that aims in some ways to balance or to, com to complete the biomedical uh, um, field. So th there is this um, 
this, well, in some ways competition, but also collaboration between those spiritual uh, coaching and techniques and holistic practices on the one hand and biomedicine. Uh, and here literature is also very diverse when uh, some see this, uh, these two fields are as in opposition and other as more in collaboration. Actually, such empirical studies uh, propose to see how uh, actors actually combine those different techniques with biomedicine. So this is a very important uh, point. So today, I would like to think out loud about the emergence of spiritual coaching in the religious and healthcare landscapes, and discuss how, how we as scholars of religion can approach spiritual coaching in a fruitful way to enrich our field. So I would first like to explore some social and legal issues, then to broach conceptual and and epistemological concerns and propose a relevant methodology that Paul and I, and I have used to study spiritual coaching. And then if we have time, present a few exploratory data to prompt discussion and consider the limits and scope of research on uh, spiritual uh, coaching. So um, just a, a broad uh, view on the literature, spiritual coaching uh, is actually, has to be, um, understood uh, in the scope of a long tradition of healing that is encored uh, in various institutional uh, religions. And uh, spiritual coaching, coaching is also embodied by archetypal, archetypal figures, the healer, the exorcist, the shaman, the chaplains. And we in Quebec, we also have the uh, spiritual health care givers that, have, that substitute now the, the, the chaplains. This practice is also fitting to a wider market of alternative and complementary medicine in a context of therapeutic pluralism. So this embraces mind-body practices, new age healing, ethno healing, religious healing, and those different categories of course overlap. These trends have been amplified uh, by the pandemic and by opportunities presented by media and digital resources because most of the spiritual coaches uh, actually are active on the web, uh, on virtual spaces. Some of them never meet their clients one on, on, on one on way, um, face to face, but only on virtual spaces. And for some, the virtual space allow them to protect themselves in some ways from the what they call the the the, the energies of their clients that can sometimes suck their own energy. So, so there, there, there would be something to, to dig some probably here. So the first point I wanted to raise is these uh, issues of social uh, and legal uh, um, dimensions of this, uh, of this topic. Uh, here in Quebec, uh, we can say that the topic is really, um, is really delicate. But uh, Paul and I wanted to make a comparison uh, in order to compare the different legal regulation because in Quebec, well, in Canada, there are different provinces and you have Quebec on the Eastern part of Canada and on the other side, you have um, British Columbia. And those are two very different provinces in many, many ways. But regarding the regulation of uh, holistic practices, these uh, differences are really, really important. Because in Canada, uh, the, the provinces hold primary responsibility in most matters related to health. But in Quebec, practitioners who offer health services to the public are strictly controlled. And there's even a law that restricts certain activities related to mental health and human relations to practitioners who belong to professional associations like social workers, psychologists, family therapists, Nevertheless, the recurring labor shortage com combined with ongoing budget cuts continues to make access to the medical system quite difficult. And this explains the growing use of alternative health healthcare techniques in Quebec. In BC, the, 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 the legal regulation is quite different because there's been recently a loosening of legal restrictions that once aimed at protecting professional exclusivity and um, this used to allow healthcare professionals respective scopes of practice. Um, and, and now those practice overlap, th those scopes of practice overlap. And the formerly restricted activities can now be uh, carried out by non-registered or non-regulated persons like yoga teachers, massage therapists, energy 
holistic healers, naturopaths. So here, you see that on one hand in Quebec, there is the College of Médecins, so the physician associations and prof professional orders that uh, set strict parameters to distance spiritual coaches and their holistic practices from the healthcare systems. But on the other hand, you have British Columbia uh, um, that has begun a reflection process with the goal of strengthening co cooperation between doctors and alternative practitioners as the key, they say, to receive high quality treatment. And I have to say that this loosening of regulation is the end product of pressure that patients have put on the system. While in Quebec, there is pressure, but the, the, the system has not loosened yet. And I think it's really, it would be interesting to, to see in other countries how the regulation uh, um, um, restrict uh, those uh, holistic activities and their and entanglement with the biomedical system or not. For example, in Switzerland, there is collaboration between uh, the healthcare system and uh, the uh, complementary medicine, while in other countries like France, th there is no, there is no openness. So, so this is a, a, an issue uh, that, of course, um, frames the the topic of spiritual coaching. The second topic uh, I wanted to talk about uh, is uh, the conceptual framework. And there are many, of course, uh, concepts that uh, we can use to broach this phenomenon. First, the concept of spiritual coach that we have designed as a particular form of coaching that specifically and explicitly engages the language of spirituality because there is the industry of coaching on a broader term, but spiritual coaching in particular uses the language of spirituality or it mobilizes mobilizes practices stemming from spiritual and religious traditions, implicitly or not. It is also oriented towards goals such as spiritual growth, self-fulfillment, or finding meaning. This is a big, big topic. Find, give meaning to anything, and especially suffering. And it aims at a profound transformation of the self. So this is a broad category, and it includes practitioners who do not present themselves as, as uh, coaches, because on fieldwork, we have found many persons that do not present themselves as coaches, but they say they are mentors, facilitators, accompaniers, but actually they correspond to the definition I just gave. Uh, and this uh, category also uh, embraces the religious traditional accompaniment, like Christian spiritual uh, direction, uh, for example. I also, oh, sorry. Um, I also have to say that there is a lot of variations uh, around this definition of spiritual coaching, but there are some family resemblances. Um, most of the spiritual coaches share a vision of the oneness of the universe. They also have the conviction that the medical system is hostile or indiffer indifferent to spiritual perspectives. They also have a belief in the possibility of supernatural intervention in the empirical world, including to heal persons. So that is the, 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 the commonalities uh, that we can find among spiritual coaches, even though spiritual coaching is not really an emic term. Uh, some people do not identify up as spiritual coaches. So I would, uh, so what about spirituality? What kind of definition of spirituality uh, in the term spiritual coaches? So here we understand spirituality in the heuristic sense and not necessarily as a discourse um, that, uh, that, that, that is mobilized uh, by actors because many coaches do not refer to spirituality but to holistic dimension. They talk much more about holistic dimension than uh, about spirituality. And there is very often a political and social uh, reasons um, for this, because in, in some contexts, like in Quebec, for example, anything that relates to religion or even spirituality is seen as a taboo. So they prefer present themselves as holistic uh, practitioners, for example. They talk about consciousness, energy, vibration, mystery. Uh, um, and uh, so the consensus is about holistic vision. And uh, here the concept of holism can also be 
uh, explored much more. Broadly speaking, it, uh, it is defined as a vision that conceives the body as well as emotions, the mind, and sometimes the psyche as a complex, integrated whole, contributed to the well-being of the individual, to one's overall experience of illness or disease, to the realization of one's own healing potential, or to the restoration of mind-body unity. And this idea of unity is really, really prevalent uh, in this milieu. But the, the word of uh, holism can be traced traced back to ancient religious and philosophical traditions. Um, but today, the current emic usage of this term presupposes that all reality is one in essence, and that matter and energy, physical and non-physical entities coexist and constantly affect each other, so in, in the kind of system. And, uh, also, this discourse on the holistic view is increasingly rooted in neurosciences, in um, quantum physics, and cognitive theories. So those people, they often uh, rely on, this, uh, on sciences. They love relying on sciences to legitimize uh, their practices and their view. So um, th there is also this uh, as I talked, this legal and social construction of an opposition between the holistic practices and biomedicine. But actually, uh, I, would, I would prefer to see this uh, topic and this phenomenon of spiritual coaching uh, as, uh, as a phenomenon that renews a historical entanglement between spiritual and healthcare settings. So Paul and I have tried to design uh, a research where we would elaborate an interdisciplinary understanding of holistic coaching by uh, using this broad field of health humanities that mobilizes religious studies, anthropology, medical sciences, psychology, by developing connections between ethnographic methods, concepts drawn from religious studies, the healthcare field's conception of health, and practice, practical applications in terms of clinical accompaniment. So we, we would like to design this research in a broad field of health humanities that would gather together uh, people from different uh, uh, disciplines. And this uh, field of health humanities has been designed by Crawford. And she uh, defines this field as a field that champions the application of the arts and humanities in interdisciplinary research, education and social action to inform and transform health and social care, health or well-being. So she said, it aims to be inclusive of viewpoints and contributions from within and beyond medicine. It also aims to value the experiences and resources of the public. It aims to explore diverse approaches to achieving, maintaining or recovering quality of life and strives for demonstrable impacts, not least in providing new evidence and insights for the education and practices of those planning, organizing, or working for the health of any population. So our view is that a research on spiritual coaching or, on, or holistic practices should gather uh, on the table and even on the field people from the biomedical uh, field in order to engage a conversation between those different views of health and healing and, and caring. So, so that would be very fruitful, uh, we think, but it's also very innovative and maybe we have to educate a little bit uh, the, the field to this kind of broad approaches. So as far as methodology is, is, we con is concerned, uh, the, the, the method we designed is empirical and qualitative. And the first step is to, uh, is to do ethnography because spiritual coaches, holistic practices are very, very uh, present on the, on the website, uh, on Instagram, on Facebook. And this is the, the, the way they just advertise their services. And this is also the, the, the platform where they give their services to, where they offer the services. Uh, there, there are in-person um, services, but there are also many um, um, conferences, talks, uh, and even meetings on, on, online. So ethnography is really, really uh, a useful uh, way uh, to, um, to grasp uh, 
some of the of the trends and some of the um, parameters of uh, of spiritual coaching. We also uh, have started to do in person interviews, and what was very interesting to do is to also take videos of the spaces where those people uh, practice their their coaching and their holistic practices, because there is a materiality related to those to those practices. I will come back to it a bit further later. We also have decided to do case studies with participant observation because some of the coaches offer uh, free uh, trials online or in person. So that is really uh, helpful for doing research. This also uh, raises the issue of, well, the methodological issue and question of experience. What about experiences on fieldwork? And this is a very broad topic for anthropologists. Where should, uh, what is the, the limit of our engagement in our on our fieldwork? And this is sometimes personal. This is also an epistemological issue. But uh, I think we cannot save uh, a little bit of participation uh, on this uh, fieldwork if we want to uh, understand exactly what's going on. Uh, because there is this particular conception of the core of the body, of the sensations, of the emotion, of the aptic uh, dimension of, of coaching and holistic practices. So, uh, I, I mean, participation ha has to be included in some ways and to some extent. There is there are also secondary data like booklets, uh, material, um, um, objects, uh, stones, uh, etc. That can also be very helpful to understand how those services uh, understand healing and how they they process healing. And uh, we also uh, triangulate those different uh, data, interviews, observation, and secondary literature and, and data. Oh, uh, time and money are really uh, important considerations because some uh, spiritual coaches accept to open their doors to uh, uh, observers like like uh, researchers, but other uh, want uh, researchers to pay, uh, and, and this is of course understandable. But this raises uh, consider considerations regarding uh, investment to the to the research. So we have. Gathered a few data. This is very exploratory. Uh, we haven't had time to dig more, but we have still a, a few data in British Columbia and in Quebec because we wanted to do this comparison between those two contexts that are uh, structured by very different legal frameworks. And we also had a team that was involved in the in the in the data, uh, in the collection of data. And broadly speaking, uh, that's that's what we wanted to uh, collect. Who are the spiritual coaches? What kind of services do they offer? What are their approaches? Um, what uh, other approaches they rely on? What are their inspirations in terms of spirituality, in terms of religious tradition, in terms of syncretism also? Who are the clients? And also uh, the pandemic's effects uh, that, uh, that is not so important uh, on this fieldwork because many spiritual coaches were actually already very present uh, on virtual spaces. So for some, this didn't really change their practice, while for others who really work on the body, on the not on the flesh, but on the body, on emotions, uh, on the interaction, uh, it changed uh, a lot their approaches. So um, we have, with the very few data we have, uh, especially collected on, on the net, uh, we have uh, managed to propose a kind of typology of spiritual coaches. This is really exploratory. And this typology is based on the technique that is used. Um, and the technique that is also related to the kind of profile of the spiritual coaches. So we have um, identified like five different categories uh, in this typology. So the first uh, coaching, uh, style of coaching would be centered on a charismatic uh, and very motivational individual who would actually base uh, his coaching technique on his or her own life path. And, uh, and the charisma that this life path has uh, uh, gave them, given them. Um, the second style uh, is the coaching that is more inspired by scientific or medical knowledge and techniques. And this would include transpersonal psychology, 
of uh, neuralink neuralistic uh, programmation, for example. The third style is the coaching that is inspired by religious, spiritual, or shamanic traditions. The fourth uh, is the coaching inspired by a spiritual master or esoteric techniques. Though this style of coaching is uh, very inspired by uh, Asian uh, traditions. And uh, another style is really directly uh, focused on women, on femininity, on sexuality, uh, and on uh, giving a new status on the female uh, dimension uh, of, of the divine with this idea of reconnecting the female and the male but this reconnection has to go through um, a rehabilitation of the women and female part of, of, uh, of spirituality so I would like to present now because I think I still have time uh, two examples of spiritual coaches uh, that I met uh, on Fieldwork in Quebec. So the first there is uh, Isabel, who offers a very personalized uh, coaching. Uh, coaching. She uh, has a, an interesting profile. She, she combines co gnostic and uh, an esoteric uh, type of spirituality with a very well structured coaching um, 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 training. She has a coaching certification from a well-known a coaching um, agency and she actually teaches in this coaching agency but at the same time she has digged a lot the gnostic and uh, um, spiritualities and esotericism and she tries to combine both to offer uh, her services and when I met her what really struck me is that she has a clear vocation and a clear, very clear vision uh, of the of the spiritual coaching she wants to offer, which is very personalized. So, so it's a very one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, basis as a spiritual coaching. And she says she has studied a lot uh, esotericism with a spiritual master, but she now wants to widespread uh, and apply her vision of spirituality and make a, a, a broader um, um, audience uh, um, uh, take advantage of, of, of it. But she said at the same time that she feels what she calls the spiritual phobia in Quebec. Um, so some of those coach, coaches actually uh, um, offer the service uh, and have uh, exposure very underground because in some ways they fear this, this uh, um, uh, um, criticism and of also the dislegitimation, I don't know if it is, illegitimization that they can face on um, public sphere. So she has an individual coaching uh, services approach. Uh, and she, uh, when I met her, she was just starting her, her coaching uh, company while I met other persons on the field work who are much more uh, established. Like, uh, for example, Natalie, who is really interesting. Natalie, she doesn't see herself as a spiritual coach. She has no training in coaching. She, she identifies and presents herself as a summer camp motivators, a motivator. She says, well, life is like a summer camp. Uh, we ha you have to approach life uh, in a very playful, playful way. And if, uh, any experience uh, in this life has to be approached as, a, as an experience that allows us to, to grow. And also we have to take distance from the seriousness of those experiences. So she, she's very charismatic and really extravagant. She rejects lab label. And uh, on the same time, she has business that attracts thousands of people. She, she really has a business with assistants that work for her uh, full time, uh, but all her services are at distance online. And she uses a lot the storytelling method uh, where she would talk about her own life path, where she was a, a very famous and brilliant uh, journalist and then she had burnout and then she decided to capitalize on her spiritual um, gifts. And her gift is to channel energies. And uh, it's really interesting to see her online channeling energies and exchanging with her clients uh, through the chats uh, on Zoom. But at the same time, she's very connected with what she said, the invisible world. So her distinction is really that she uh, proposes a very playful way of living. And this is a form of spiritual hedonism. So, for example, when I 
well, when I interviewed her, I wanted to take pictures of her room, of the of the space of, of work. So, but it's really basic. It's just, as you see, a computer uh, and there is a mic. And she said, well, maybe I just have one object that I like. And this is this stone that you can see. And I said, and she said, I like this stone because it's ha it has a penis uh, form. And I, I like it because for me, it's it's just a way of saying, you know, like this playful, just enjoy, have pleasure. And this is, this is very spiritual. So her approach is based on questions. She always asks the, her clients questions. Example, how would it be if you change this behavior? How would it feel to do this? So she, so she likes challenging persons by asking questions and reformulating uh, all, all the discourses with positive frame, like with uh, this idea of owning her own one own power and removing obstacles. So, um, so a few trends that uh, that emerge from this world of coaching. Of first, the semantics. There is a lot of attention that is devoted to the words because words have frequencies. So, what you say uh, when you say something. You're gonna attract it because when you say you 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 give frequency and power to what you say, so you're gonna attract it because words have frequencies. Also, these concepts of community. This is really interesting because coaching is quite individual, but people see themselves as part of communities of spiritual communities that all work for the same thing, raise their energy, raise vibration, reach spiritual connection, uh, uh, and, and purity in one sense. So the concept of energy, of vibration, of frequency are really, really uh, widespread. Uh, there is also a particular terminology uh, devoted to pain, like pain would be related to uh, experiencing judgment from the others. The others judge me, that's why uh, I, I suffer, or the weight of the ego, and also this idea of vulnerability. And very interestingly, showing or feeling uh, one's own vulnerability is seen as a step towards towards being healed. Uh, you have to experience your vulnerability be before being uh, healed and reaching uh, spiritual fulfillment. What is really important is that the psychological perspective is always present. And this is part of the mass psychology culture that has been um, documented in the literature that is that features contemporary um, northern societies and secular societies. Uh, and this is also part of a trend uh, that tends to uh, psychologize uh, experiences. And uh, at the same time, it's also part of a trend that tends to therapeutize uh, society and to, to therapeutize also spiritual experiences. Um, so this is a, a few trends. If I have time, do I ha still have time, Rafael? Yeah. Still have yeah. Okay. So I would like to broach. I mean, uh, if if you can just wrap up, um, go towards wrapping up, wrapping it up, um, so we can just have some time also to discuss. But yeah, you, I mean, conclude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted maybe to say a few words about how the spiritual coaches situate themselves regarding the conditions in their own province. I have some some quotes here uh, from. Um, from the spiritual coaches that I met in, in British Columbia uh, that, that really celebrate the fact that there is no local regulation. Um, like this, uh, this last quote, this last quote of the a spiritual coach who said that regulation is a security, uh, but diplomats do not make good coaches. Uh, uh, and this this person was very interested. It's interesting because uh, he said that uh, people has to have to be more intuitive, a bit more wiser. And if you you, you do not have to rely on 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 diploma uh, that is that are um, uh, security, but you have to uh, values intuition and, and wisdom. Uh, so and as people do not have intuition or they do not listen to their intuition or inner wisdom, well, they refer to directory and look for people with a bunch of letters. But how do you certify 35 years of meditation? That was a spiritual coach that had a very deep approach of meditation and mindfulness. And he, he relied on this experience to, to uh, show his, his knowledge and to, uh, to coach.
approach people. So there is no certification for 30 years of meditation. How do you certify wisdom or joy or knowledge? I, I, I think this is really interesting. In Quebec, uh, the people actually, the spiritual coaches were scared. They were scared of being sued by the college of physicians uh, that actually track people, <laughs> track spiritual coaching. And if they dare to use the word uh, therapy or diagnosis or healing on their website, they would be sued for illegal practice of, of medicine. So uh, people that I met who took up the wide wing extreme movement of the psychologist order or the physician order uh, because they see they really see them uh, as uh, as conservative and uh, and really authoritative and um, doing like a a, a hunt of witches. Uh, so so they really uh, in, in Quebec they they criticize this uh, the very strict regulation. But on the opposite, they also see that there are some abuses, uh, of course, uh, in this in this area. So some of them. Propose, we're proposing to have an ethical charter that would be shared by the spiritual coaches who would design their own ethics uh, in order to ensure that some they, they would put themselves their own uh, restriction and values to, to their work. So, uh, well, I just summarized. Um, and I wanted to finish with the limits and scope of studying spiritual coaching through a video studies uh, lens. So, um, of course, when you in study this kind of topic, voluntarily or not, you influence the recognition of, 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 the, of the actors that you study uh, and you increase their legitimacy. For example, uh, I interviewed someone who was just thinking of becoming a spiritual coach and starting to design her own website and didn't really know how to frame it. And I did the, the interview with her and she actually only accepted to, uh, to meet me because she was very curious of the questions that I would have. And actually she told me, well, the questions you have allow me to, to specify my approach. And at the end of the interview, she wanted me to give her my, um, my, the, the record because she wanted to take some quotes that she had said to advertise her service uh, on the internet. So in one way, in one way the, the, the research was constricting <laughs> the object of research and even increasing the legitimacy of the object of research. So, so that's, that's uh, something we have to, to consider when we study uh, a phenomenon that are on the rise. Um, also, another uh, idea is that such research would be very fruitful if it, if it was um, uh, approached through uh, an intersectorial conversation with clinical milieu and uh, possibly influence the dominant healthcare system. Uh, this would be a very interesting application of our studies in, in, uh, on, on religion and spirituality, even in anthropology. Um, and for future research, uh, I think uh, what would be interesting is to refine our own semantics because I used to use, um, I used to use uh, the term spiritual coaching, but I was not really satisfied with this term because people did not so much identify. And I think maybe a, a lot of people didn't even answer my um, request for interviews because they didn't identify to the spiritual coaching uh, title of the research. So maybe to refine our semantics, a spirituality, holistic uh, dimension, what is the difference? How do they relate? Uh, what is coaching and what is mentoring uh, and so forth and so on. And, uh, and the holistic practices also has to be more fine-tuned uh, because it's like an umbrella term uh, that gather uh, many, many different practices, uh, as I showed uh, with the typology that I presented before. And uh, maybe we have to, 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 to fine-tune also this, uh, this umbrella term. So there is a lot of work. Um, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Geraldine, for this um, quite um, amazing presentation. It's really, really interesting. I think that it resonates with um, a lot of um, 
uh, as here with our research and um, our approaches in different ways. Um, so I would like to open the floor for any comments, questions, or Cool. Can I could I just uh, hi Raphael uh, and thanks Geraldine that was wonderful as as I knew it would be I you can see why I mean I so appreciate the both the the kind of empirical texture of your account but also the way you embed that account in a quite advanced theoretical framework um, that's why I, I love working with you uh, one of the things I, I was looking forward to or I am looking forward to in this kind of research and in our conversation is thinking about how these issues look in other regions. Because the comparison between British Columbia and, and Quebec, although again, we're provinces in the same country, we're different in the same way that Catalan or Catalonia is different than the rest of Spain, right? So uh, are the different health regimes that Geraldine sketched, where in Quebec, there's a lot of state control, they're fairly comfortable with state control. It's sort of an understood feature of Quebec culture. And in BC, there's more uh, suspicion or there's more of a latitude when it comes to these kind of adjacent alternative professionals. Um, and I'm just curious in the rest of your societies, in Italy and Spain and Brazil and elsewhere, how this looks if you, if you see these tensions playing out differently in different regions of your societies. I just um, I would like to in, in relation to that maybe also I, I couldn't help to to not think about um, some of my previous research and also as I know uh, some uh, of uh, Geraldine's work on on Pentecostal pastors in migratory contexts and I remembering working also trying to figure out how to address the counter kind of, the kind of counseling that they do in the churches. Um, in many areas of people's lives, financially, uh, in terms of health. And back then I thought about working with the concept of spiritual brokers and I actually wrote about it. And, but it was always a little bit tricky and difficult to, to look at that. But I mean, aside from that, I and mean, if, if she could, um, I would like to know also if she relates somehow to that concept or to that, con to that context, uh, um, if she ever thought about relating to that context. But in terms of regulations, I was thinking about um, if how how are how is the the legal approach or the policy if there are policies in place uh, with regard and the differences between counseling in churches, for instance, like uh, Pentecostal churches, because we do have uh, some harmful practices, for instance, that occur in Pentecostal churches, and how this is treated versus the spiritual coaching and all the, uh, let's say, threats that uh, those uh, professionals are um, are signaling, like I don't know, psychologists and medical doctors and etc. Because these are interesting comparisons, interesting regimes of um, of counseling and coaching, but maybe not using the same names. And one is religion, and the other is spiritual. So. It's a little bit messy, but it's it's there. I'd like to know if you could, you could talk a little bit about this. Yeah, I can talk about it. I just wanted to check if someone wanted to answer uh, Paul's question. That's, that is really uh, interesting because it would be interesting to see how this topic unfolds in other uh, legal environments in Italy or Spain or any other environments. We had we had this idea of doing a broad international comparison, comparing Quebec and British Columbia was just the first step, and then, you know, embrace other countries. Uh, I saw Mar wanted to maybe intervene. So, thank you for the for the presentation. It was wonderful. And uh, when you presented the legal part, I I already thought that it would be interesting to do uh, an international comparison because maybe if we look at the case of Spain. Uh, most of the regulation comes from the central government, so it's kind of similar, despite there are some local regulations that uh, merits there, but the approach is quite restrictive. So, uh, for example, the new government just released a new report on what they call pseudo-therapies, 
and uh, they have really a strong policy like uh, denounce your uh, fake therapist. So they, they they even create kind of evidence-based reports to show that all types of therapies from Reiki to are uh, fake. So uh, there's this strong culture against uh, this kind of therapies in Spain and in terms of the legal system and the approach that biomedicine has to them. But then, for instance, France has a very different approach, uh, Germany too. So uh, it's also, I was thinking that in the comparison would be interesting in terms of Europe. So uh, because, yeah, for instance, the, the, the classic argument here when you interview a, a practitioner, a therapist, and so they told you, well, this used to be, or this is uh, recognized, or this for, belongs to the social uh, to the public health systems in France, for instance, you ask ah, about the homeopathy, and they say no. Here it's uh, it's in the private sector. It's uh, bad considered, but in France they, you know, it's it's always these references about the the good context where they are well treated and the bad context where they are. But uh, yeah. but yeah, I have no more cons. But I think that's this is very fascinating, and and we could think about. Uh, comparison at some point but maybe Matteo from Italy or just here you have different yes yeah we have Josiah here thank you very much for uh for your presentation um quite interesting and uh, fascinating um yeah I was also curious about how um this would uh kind of turn out when studying in Africa, um, Southern Africa. And um, the reasons probably might be different um, why people uh, they will go for um, spiritual coaching. Um, it's something that is kind of emerging in Zimbabwe, for example. But the reason being that um, the healthcare is collapsing whilst um, these alternative, you know, um, medicines or um, the um these are the complementary systems they tend to be cheaper and also they tend to even offer um prescript prescriptive solutions that are also quite accessible uh to people so i think it's we we i mean they might be need to broaden beyond europe and also look into other contexts where there's different economic political and even um, belief system and you would find out that um the spiritual coaching they take a different form um, yoga and all this, they, they are there, but they don't really call yoga in, in, in this sense. So I think yep, there's that need even to, to open up the idea of spiritual coaching because they might not be really considered as spiritual within the context, but these are alternative health medicine primarily this, 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 these things are not seen as spiritual in that uh, in that sense. So I think a, a global start might actually give um, different flavors to how these things um plays out in different contexts. But also I had, um, I had, a, I had a, a question um about uh, on how are you are you going to focus on also this yoga, this mindfulness training and how they've been used to um to enhance productivity within workplaces. They're not really spiritual. I mean at times they're not they're not packaged as also spiritual you know um activities but we see a lot of corporates embracing them and kind of in, encouraging their members to partake in these activities and as a, as one way of increasing productivity helping workers balance work and life is the, is it something that you think you you would pursue in uh probably in the project I'm not, I'm sorry I'm, I'm not trying to understand your question can you explain a little bit more so I was saying um for example, there are some corporates, some organizations that have started introducing yoga, for example, at workplaces oh, yeah. okay, as a yeah, way yeah. of enhancing productivity. This is not really spiritual, but yeah. are, we, are you interested in kind of seeing the relationship between this mindfulness and capitalism yeah. or and neoliberal discourse broadly? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mentioned it when I did the literature uh, review, when I said that in the in the literature, uh, th there is a broad um, trend to see these kind of practices like helping the neoliberal system 
like putting the pressure on the, on the individual uh, in order to make the individual more efficient, more uh, useful. So, so yeah, there is this whole literature. We didn't really want uh, plan to uh, study this spiritual coaching in this specific area of the workplace because there's a lot of literature on this actually, especially on mindfulness in the, in the workplace. Um, but that it could be an avenue. That could be an avenue. But we, I mean, what is really interesting is it's more this free for all space on the on the on the internet where uh, people just offer the services and clients would just use those services on a on a very clientelist basis, you know, just as they need according to their need on a on a punctual uh, yeah way. Basis. So, in a, in a sense, Geraldine, it just it, as another reflection on Josiah's uh, question, uh, spiritual coaching has yet to be instrumentalized by corporations or governments, right? It's still at this at the stage that you and I are at the stage in our societies, at least. It's still really the response of the individual person relating to the spiritual coach or vital or and the coach marketing to the individual. As of yet, the governments and health systems are not really sure quite what to do with it or, or whether or not these these adjacent parallel caregivers uh really have a function to make ibm you know generate more profits or to make make you a better worker um that's i think that's not yet the case uh that that's the principal focus though certainly in the mindfulness and yoga that we see in workplaces certainly that is a legitimate critique of those phenomena and I think that in Matteo's webinar, he details that critique uh, quite effectively. Yeah, I don't know if you want to listen to maybe Matteo's and then you, you can yep. have all the questions at this point yep. and then maybe we can move forward maybe a second round of that. So, okay, Matteo. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Geraldine, for the presentation. It was a pleasure to hear about your work again. And uh, it always uh, stimulates and, and make me think uh, regarding the question of, uh, so to say, the regulation of, uh, of this, these practices in Italy, for instance, I'm not an expert, but I have a little bit of uh, old on the scenario on yoga. But I think what I'm saying can be a little bit more generalized is that if you account for, let's say, uh, this broad field accounting for, let's say, the psi sciences, psychologies, and so on, those have a specific form of regulation. If we speak about uh, biomedicine, again, that's quite well recognized as an, another form of regulation. Holistic practices, of course, have a different uh, form of, reg of regulation. Uh, so, uh, how to say same normative context, but quite uh, quite a different scenario compared uh, to the type of practice. But even those practice practices that are not legitimized, perhaps at a normative level, or those professionals are not uh, inserted within an order, for instance, like the psychologists or the social workers, they still recognize what they do. Uh, so here there is an issue of authority, of course, of what is legitim legitimate knowledge or not. Uh, and make me think uh, also what, what you were um, presenting at the end of your presentation was quite suggestive uh, because uh, some of your practitioners seem to disregard uh, this credentialism you know, and, and the aspect of being legitimized um, by uh, the, 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 the national system or whatever that is, the, 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 the professional organization. But at the same time, they must seek some form of uh, uh, credentialism in a way. And I wonder, uh, you know, it's right. You cannot perhaps uh, get a certificate of 20 years of meditation, but this perhaps is an embodied capital, right? Uh, it takes another form. It takes a form of connections, meeting, experience, legitimacy within specific circles. So maybe if you can uh, tell us something more about this, the, the way in which people somehow uh, um, legitimize uh, their positions, uh, considering that uh, certificates and credentials are not so so perhaps so useful in, in such an unregulated field. So I made a little bit of a loop, but hopefully. Yeah. 
Um, okay. <clears throat> So uh, thank you for those very stimulating questions. Uh, I will start uh, with this question, with the Raphael's question regarding the pen. Well, I think it's Raphael. Yeah, yeah. Uh, regarding Pentecostal pastors who offer counseling in churches, and um, yeah, as I said, spiritual coaching, not in this world, but um, the, the 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 phenomena of spiritual coaching exists has always been existing in religious traditions, but what is interesting in this uh, phenomena that we that we presented, it's that is totally deregulated, disinstitutionalized. While spiritual uh, uh, the, the Pentecostal counseling, the Christian uh, spiritual direction is framed within a religious traditional uh, tradition. And spiritual coaching, it's like a free for all. And in some ways it reflects one of the trend of the religious transformation uh, nowadays that is more, as we all know, privatized, individualized, and people pick and choose uh, what suits better their needs. And spiritual coaching, it's, uh, is part of this long tradition of direction, spiritual accompaniment that has been introduced by um, religious traditions, but it now takes the new form of religious um, uh, behaviors today that is more pick and choose, more also inserted in the neoliberal dynamic. And uh, and this is why it, it can, it, it's worth studying. I mean, spiritual coaching is a form of deregulation of uh, spiritual uh, accompaniment that you can find in Pentecostal churches, in Christian churches. Uh, so it, it's the deregulation and it's really curious in one way because it's the deregulation of spiritual accompaniment, but at the same time, it's very, very, very regulated on the legal uh, the, um, uh, uh, side. Um, so you mentioned also the work of psychologists, and of course, uh, it's not always clear where is the frontier between spiritual coaching and life coaching or psychological uh, therapy. Uh, I, I agree, uh, especially because even in religions, we can find uh, a, a lot of influence from psychological theories. Um, when I did field work in Muslim mosque uh, uh, two, two years ago, I wrote, I was very, very, um, how can I say, uh, surprised to see um, a conference uh, in the mosque on a psychological theory, the, the Kapman's triangle, uh, which says that in any social relationship, you're either the savior or the victim or the per per perpetrator. And this was in a mosque. And they imported those, those psychological theories in order to uh, help the believers to be better Muslims, to uh, master better the emotions as a good Muslim and so forth and so on. So psychology is a bit everywhere, including in this uh, in this um, field of spiritual coaching. And so I, I see those different spheres overlapping one on the other. Um, and here, um, maybe uh, there is more work to do. I cannot say more, except that there, the, those psychological theories uh, and approaches are used because they are very present in any sphere of our societies uh, in this following the individual uh, uh, individualization of our societies but also because this is a way to legitimize and this is one form of uh, answering uh, Matteo's question this is one of the way those people legitimize uh, their approach because they try to rely on science uh, be, that can be a psychological uh, discipline, but also quantum physics. Quantum physics is very, very much involved and referred to uh, to explain what's going on when the when the Reiki uh, is going on. So it's just physics, uh, the law at, the law of, of attraction. When I talked uh, before about the words who, that have frequency, and this uh, would be uh, supported by the law of attraction. That is also something that can be uh, supported by quantum physics. So that legitimation is really relies on the scientific knowledge and advances. Uh, 
um, but they also they also have some form of diploma. For example, uh, they would uh, they would take uh, training in coaching. Uh, many of them would just train to be to be good trainers, uh, co coach coach. Sorry, but at the same time, they they involve. Um, I mean, they they combine uh, coaching with a spiritual flavor that is not quantifiable. That is not. Um, uh, um, how can I say? Uh, that that is harder to legitimize. But still, many coaches that I met have on their wall the diploma of coaching. You know. And I also have to say that the, the principles, the spiritual principles or the holistic techniques they rely on are more and more, um, how can I say, um, um, advertised and, uh, um, and, and you can find more and more agencies that propose training in those holistic uh, practices. For example, I've been doing a lot of... Uh, uh, field work among people who practice core energetics and core energetics is very holistic approach that has a psychological and even psychoanalytical flavor and uh, the people would train themselves in core energetics and have their own agency that would be recognized in the holistic sphere. So the, I mean, the diploma are not necessarily diploma stemming from university or recognized official science, but in some ways, those people are developing their own science and their own understanding of science. And this would be very interesting to, to, to dig. Uh, the second question, I don't remember, I think it's Mar. Uh, who asked uh, about uh, the legitimacy of, uh, or who talked about the legitimacy of different uh, medicine, talking about homeopathy that is recognized in some contexts and not in others. And, and it's true that, once again, you have to make a typology in the holistic practices, in this whole area of holistic practices with different uh, practices that are more recognizable than others. This is the whole issue of recognition. And um, uh, it, it just comes to my mind, the philosopher Axel Onet, who talked about uh, the, the theory and the philosophy of recognition. He used this philosophy, especially for the people who are ostracized, marginalized. But uh, he developed a very interesting philosophy saying that some people are more recognizable than others because they use the language uh, of, the, of the authority that had the power to recognize the other. And some, some of those practices, they're very well um, equipped to use the language uh, of the legal, of the legal uh, actors and to be recognizable and to be recognized, just like homeopathy and naturopathy. But many spiritual coaches that I met have very esoteric practices, but at the same time, they have managed to be recognized as naturopaths. And this is natural path. Uh, naturopathy is recognized by the state, and the and the clients can be even refunded by their own uh, health insurance when they go and visit the spiritual coach, because the spiritual coach has been um, ha um, able to navigate the language of recognition of the state in order to be recognized as naturopath. And as such, uh, they, they have this recognition why, in fact, what they do is really energetical, is really esoteric and spiritual and, and, not, uh, uh, and do not really relate to, to naturopathy. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a negotiation that you do uh, and that they do to be recognized by using the language of recognition that they know will be, will be legitimized uh, by the by the state and by the ones who have the power to recognize or not. Um, I, I think I answered most of, most of the questions. Yes, Paul? Yeah, thanks, Mara. Uh, thanks, Jared, that's great. Um, one thing that I, I think we didn't talk very much about in the in our proposal and, and that, that you didn't really tease out very much in your um, presentation was what, what I guess we would call either the charismatic or the aesthetic uh, dimension of this phenomena and the people that we're talking about. 
because it often seems to me when I meet spiritual coaches, uh, for that matter, even when I meet yoga teachers and do a netnography of that, or also just travel through yoga land, that a lot of the people who rise to high positions within the spiritual coaching world or in the yoga world are fairly convinced, they have a fairly common feel and look about them, you know, to use, to since Mateo's uh, um, back on the image uh, on my screen, they are in some sense Jivan Muktis. These are people who are liberated while living. And so there is, there's a way in which their bodily comportment and their presentation on their websites is a presentation which says, look, I'm not a mem I'm not, I don't have an MD. I'm not an employee of the state. Uh, I, I don't officially belong to this or that government regulated body. But look at me. I exude health. I'm beautiful. Look at me with my dogs and against the you know, backdrop of the ocean. And I, I am just, I, I'm trustworthy partially because you can feel it in my body, that I have a kind of a presence. There is a kind of a personal charisma. There's also a kind of borrowing of aesthetic tropes that are very popular within popular culture that convey the message that this person is, ra his or her health, almost always her, frankly, is radiant and it, it, it flows out of them and it, and, it, and it should compel you as a potential client, patient, client, whatever, to have a sense of confidence, right? Whereas if you have a terrible lump in your neck or some other medical ailment, you don't really care that your doctor is good looking. She's wearing a white coat and she went, she got an MD from whatever university. So you have a kind of a imprimatur that comes from the state, that comes from capital S science. But in the case of spiritual coaching, the the field, as it were, is less regulated. And so the reliance or the, the leaning is in the direction of a very common char charisma and a very common sort of somewhat sexualized in some cases, aesthetic, where, where the people, the person better be beautiful. They will be way more affluent and way more popular and way more compelling as a caregiver if they're conventionally attractive. That's true. I think this connects very well, Paul, with uh, Josiah's comment uh, when he talks about, uh, he's, he mentioned in the chat, in sociology or religion, we have not been paying much attention to the concept of authenticity. What is it and how do clients evaluate and assess it? So, um, yeah, this charisma, this sort of enchantment that, that generates, like, the exude, is very interesting. Giuseppe um, also has got a question. Yes, uh, uh, my question, thank you for your presentation, Geraldine. Uh, my question maybe is a little bit philosophical, and I don't know if it's in the aims of the research, but always when I think uh, in the terms of coaching and spirituality, um, I think in the book of the German philosopher Peter Sloterdijk, you must change your life. He, and he, he talks about that the characteristical feature of the contemporary life is that all of us need to train ourselves all the time. We need to train ourselves all the time. It's um, our aim. Um, my question is, um, sorry about, about my English. Uh, why we need the codes? Why why these codes are here? Why we um, and uh, it's my my question. I, I don't know if the research wants to to know about that. I I, I think it's much more focused about the ways that the codes work and all of this. But why we need codes? Yes, yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, and it is really related to the definition of the subject on which we rely in our society. Uh, I would like to, to refer here to Charles Taylor, idea of the subject who has an inner being. This is how we frame the subject. The individual today is someone who has a, an individual, uh, an inner uh, life and a sort of interiority. And I, I think also I come back to this idea of neoliberalism, but we are in a 
in a in a world where where the idea of progress of working of thriving is really really important and, and this rely on our monotheism uh, even where uh, this idea of bettering the self, being a better Muslim, being a better Christian. I mean, this neoliberalism, of course, has, has uh, also ideological roots in our monotheism. But I, I want to say this is a, a, a particularity of our society that is not shared by all societies. This idea that the subject has an inner a life, uh, interiority that, that he or she has to work on to relate to God or to be better or to master the self. This is very particular. In many societies, you do not have this idea of the subject who is a singularity uh, with his own boundaries and with this interiority. Um, I, I, I really like to, to, uh, to quote the work of my uh, colleague, uh, Christophe Pons, uh, Christophe Ponce, a French uh, anthropologist whom I really like because he, he questioned this idea of the subject who has an inner life of interiority and he, he relies on uh, some anthropolo anthropological um, works um, among people who say they are possessed. Uh, they are possessed, they have been... I'm mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Um, I'm sorry, I have like... Um, yeah who said they have been possessed. And even in Christianity, you can be possessed by the Holy Spirit. But in many, many other societies that are not framed by monotheism, you have this idea that you can be visited by a life, by entities. And in some ways, you, you do not have this inner life or interiority that neoliberalism and um, secular um, modern modern um, world um, attributes to the to the to the subject you just have like you just like um, a case and you're visited by energies by entities and you do not have any inner life so i, I think this is very particular to our monotheistic um modern uh, societies uh yeah uh, it, it's very interesting because Christophe Pont was uh, started this reflection by uh, by quoting you know the people who commit uh, crimes uh the terrorist uh, for example they sometimes say i don't know what happened i was not myself anymore it was like if someone else was acting through me. You know, even white people with monotheist heritage, they, they sometimes have this uh, consciousness that there may be something else, that this idea of inner life that is the authentic me and I have to work on to connect with what I am really. And this is, this is the discourse of spiritual coaches. But maybe the subject can be something or someone else. And there is another definition of the subject uh, that that could be uh, that could be um, considered like uh, a case was not the but the, the vehicle uh, uh, that can be visited by by other something else uh, it, to such extent that that you do not have the boundary with otherness any longer, you know, you, you know, it's no more the individuality. It could be the individuality when you're, when you talk with someone and, and there's like a shared experience and a shared, a shared um, feeling. So it's no more the, the, the same boundaries, you know, as we think in the individualized societies that we rely on. I don't know if I explained it well, but I, I, I think this idea of the subject has to be questioned, and this view of the subject has to be questioned. This is one. This is why one aspect of the research we proposed was to explore the definition of health of the individual of the subject that that those techniques rely on. Thank you, Geraldine. Um, I think we unfortunately are reaching the end. I'm pretty sure that we're going to have another opportunity to discuss uh, the open ends. Uh, it's super interesting. Uh, I was also, it just called my attention that it connected very well with Rodrigo's presentation last week and also Mateo's, but also um, already already connects to, it's also connects to, to the, our next uh, webinar, uh, 
uh, in South Africa, it, which also responds to Josiah and Paul as um, call for diverse perspectives. And our next webinar is going to be on the 28th of May with uh, Professor Lorena Nunez and um, from University of Witzwaterland and Sinetemba Makanya from University of Johannesburg. And the title is Building Bridges Between Science and African Healing Traditions of Southern Africa. Conversation with Dr. Sinatema Makanya. Um, so on this note, um, I'll thank you, Paul and Geraldine again um, for presenting and for being with us and see you on our next webinar.